So I'm not sure you'll like my smile as much, but um, uh, I'd like to thank those of you that stayed, and uh, I'd also like to, in front of everybody, apologize to the translators. I know I go really fast, so I will definitely try to go slower uh, so the translators don't yell at me again. So, t so our last topic uh, in inflammatory bowel disease will be toxic megacolon. This is a, a somewhat difficult topic that I'll get into in a moment because of the differentiation that needs to be made between acute severe colitis and true toxic megacolon, which are somewhat different. So we'll start with the case. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so we'll start with a case. This is a 37-year-old male who uh, had 12 years of pan-ulcerative colitis involving the whole entire colon. This was first diagnosed about 12 years ago. At that time, he had bloody diarrhea, and that led to a colonoscopy that revealed moderate uh, pan-ulcerative colitis. Subsequent to that, he was started on mesalamine therapy and actually did very well for about 10 years. In uh, 2010, he had a flare requiring prednisone, which is when he first came to our center. At that time, we added azathioprine to the mesalamine therapy, but in 2010 and 2011, continued having steroid requiring flares. Uh, at that point, we looked for superinfection, and I'll get into that later in the talk, about how every flare of ulcerative colitis should involve ruling out infection concurrently with Clostridium difficile or cytomegalovirus. In any case, he had no evidence of superinfection, still having flares. So at that point, late last year, uh, we were considering further therapy, but he had read about uh, complementary and herbal therapy and had chosen to stop all of his medications to pursue herbal therapy. Uh, I'm not sure how it is here, but this is not at all uncommon in the US. Uh, there are many uh, things that people see on the internet and on the television that uh, make them inclined to uh, pursue herbal therapy. So in any case, he had stopped the azathioprine and the mesalamine, and uh, he didn't know the specific names of the medications that he had taken. He had gotten them online. And in any case, he was lost to follow up for the next few months. He then presented to our emergency room <clears throat> a few months later with bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. He was having up to 12 bowel movements per day. That included both a daytime and a nocturnal component. He had another six episodes per day of what we call tenesmus, or this urgency to go to the bathroom, usually suggesting rectal inflammation. So running to the bathroom about once every hour, hour and a half, um, two-thirds of which were bowel movements. He also had crampy abdominal pain that was moderate in intensity and nausea, but no vomiting. His temperature was 39, and I had to do that in my head, so to me that's 102.2. Still not completely used to Celsius. Uh, heart rate was elevated at 112, and his blood pressure was borderline, borderline low at 104 over 74. No historical um, prior history of hypertension. His abdomen was soft but distended and diffusely tender, but no overt peritoneal signs in the way of diffuse rebound or involuntary guarding. His sedimentation rate was markedly elevated at 94, with also an elevated C-reactive protein at 18. An abdominal x-ray was performed in the emergency room, given the distension of the abdomen, and he had a colon that was dilated to 7 centimeters in the transverse colon. There was no overt evidence of a transition point to, subject, to suggest obstruction, and the small bowel loops appeared normal in caliber. So the question is how to manage this patient. So one option is to manage him conservatively, placing a nasogastric tube for the colonic distension without any evidence of small bowel distension, providing analgesia for the pain, providing him antibiotics, not allowing him to eat or drink anything by mouth, and providing fluid resuscitation. Another option, uh, the rest of the options are all more um, interventional. One can give IV or intravenous steroids, other options include intravenous cyclosporin and intravenous infliximab. Surgery also remains an option, and there, there, are, other, uh, there are multiple options here. A diversion, a diversion with or without polyethylene glycol. I believe Dr. Surowitz talked to you guys about cases in, in C. diff where you can do um, some of these types of surgeries with, uh, with a lavage, and also subtotal or total proctocolectomy. So when we first start talking about this, it's important 
to, uh, to determine what the definition truly is of colitis. And one of the problems that we have in the literature is there is a lot of heterogeneity in the definition of what we would consider a very active colitis. So some studies use the term severe colitis. Other studies use acute severe colitis. You can also find literature for toxic colitis and yet others that use fulminant colitis. Uh, I think it's best to classify and try to have a uniform, a uniform classification so that when one person refers to um, a certain de degree of colitis, there's general agreement. Recently, the, uh, the World Congress of Gastroenterology, which um, had this supplement that came out, you see the reference at the bottom of the slide a few years ago, along with the American College of Gastroenterology and the European Crohn's and Colitis Organization, had relatively good agreement that it's probably best to classify these by both distribution and severity when it comes to colitis. So we have ulcerative proctitis. We then have left-sided colitis, in, um, and a part of that is ulcerative proctosigmoiditis. And then finally, what we call pancolitis or extensive colitis, any colitis that extends beyond the splenic flexure. And then when discussing severity, there's four, uh, there's four principal ways in which we think it's probably best to, uh, to classify this so that we all are in good agreement. There are those that are in remission, and then mild, moderate, and severe disease. And then it's important to classify what we mean by each of these. Since we're discussing toxic megacolon, I will tell you that for the, uh, there's relatively good agreement on the definition of severe colitis, usually referring to more than six bloody bowel movements per day with at least one sign of toxicity. Toxicity meaning either an anemia, elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, an, a fever, or some degree of tachycardia. Having increased bowel movements in the absence of blood makes ulcerative colitis exceedingly unlikely, as I'm sure your experience um, suggests that, that ulcerative colitis invariably has blood in the stool and not just watery diarrhea, like you can see with, with uh, Crohn's disease. The American College of Gastroenterology had published this several years ago, looking at the differences between mild, moderate, and severe colitis. And in the general theme is that as you have more bowel movements per day, particularly with blood, and as you start developing systemic toxicity in the way of fever, elevated heart rate, anemia, and in elevated inf um, inflammation markers, you go from mild to moderate to severe disease. And they added a category called fulminant colitis in which there were more than 10 stools a day, perhaps requiring packed red blood cell transfusion with dilation on x-ray. So with all these definitions of mild, moderate, and severe, we didn't see any definitions specifically for toxic megacolon. And one of the difficulties in treating this is to fully understand the difference between severe colitis and, fulminant and uh, toxic megacolon, and most studies don't adequately differentiate these. So toxic megacolon, and you see some of these studies date back um, on the references back up to 50 years, that toxic megacolon is believed to be, um, or is best defined as colonic dilation of more than five and a half centimeters without obstruction, and also evidence of systemic toxicity. This tends to comprise only about 5% of what we consider severe colitis. So don't necessarily think that all severe colitis is toxic megacolon. The systemic toxicity that was described above usually refers to the things we mentioned before, like tachycardia, anemia, and fever, uh, as well as an elevated white blood cell count, as they can oftentimes get a leukemoid reaction. But there are other signs of systemic toxicity, things like a low blood pressure, altered mentation from volume depletion, as well as electrolyte disturbances that can also be considered types, or, um, or types of systemic toxicity. So what causes toxic megacolon? So the most common causes are as a complication of inflammatory bowel disease, which is why it's placed in this portion of your conference, ulcerative colitis being far more common an etiologic factor in toxic megacolon compared to Crohn's disease, although isolated colonic Crohn's disease that mimics ulcerative colitis, the so-called UC-like Crohn's disease, can also do this. It comprises about 1 in 15 to 1, um, uh, to 1 in 10 out of 10 admissions for ulcerative colitis. Amongst infectious causes, Clostridium difficile is the most common etiologic agent, but many of the other uh, agents that can cause bloody diarrhea, things like Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, and the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or the shigatoxin-like E. coli, can also uh, result in toxic megacolon. Keep in mind, parasites like entamoeba and viruses like cytomegalovirus can do the same. Less common causes of toxic megacolon include ischemia, which is uncommon because it's usually segmental, and also those that are profoundly immunosuppressed, 
uh, for example, chemotherapy. So interestingly, the pathophysiology is not all that well understood. We do know that colonic inflammation can lead to some stunting of the motility of the colon, and that relative ileus can be exacerbated by worsening inflammation, and that vicious cycle can lead to a toxic megacolon. Well, we all remember that inflammation and ulcerative colitis, unlike Crohn's disease, tends to be superficial, limited to the, uh, limited to the, the mucosa, and should not extend too much further beyond the very superficial part of the submucosa. But in toxic megacolon, uh, histologic transmural specimens at surgery have shown that there is inflammation down through the submucosa into the muscularis propria, which is rather atypical of ulcerative colitis. We do know that nitric oxide in experimental models inhibits clonic motility, and, they, and this study that was, that's referenced below had shown that when they did deeper histologic sections of surgical resections from toxic megacolon, they had very high levels of inducible nitric oxide synthase. So for, perhaps this is in part mediating increased inflammation, increased nitri nitric oxide, worsening clonic motility, and that vicious cycle leads to the clonic dilation along with the systemic toxicity. Toxic megacolon is usually the first presentation of inflammatory bowel disease or it occurs within the first few months. So it's not as common for someone to be doing well for a long period of time and then have progressive worsening of disease that leads to toxic megacolon. That was the case in our patient, but typically it occurs in the first few months after diagnosis or is the initial diagnosis of IBD uh, when they present with toxic megacolon. The diagnosis requires a combination of several things. Uh, clinical suspicion, laboratory findings, radiologic findings, and endoscopic findings in some cases. And also keep in mind that if it's not a de novo diagnosis, if they've had the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis and they've been on hot steroids, particularly high-dose steroids, then those, uh, st that steroid use can mask some of the symptoms of, uh, of toxic megacolon. So there's several diagnostic modalities that we can use. The cl most common clinical findings are the signs of toxicity that I mentioned uh, before, including uh, altered mental status and evidence of volume depletion. Prior medical history is important. Do they have a known history of inflammatory bowel disease, which should obviously make you very concerned for toxic megacolon? Do they have risk factors for IBD? So as I said, it's oftentimes the first, the first diagnosis. So do they have a family history of IBD or other risk factors that make you concerned they may be developing inflammatory bowel disease? And then the less common causes like ischemic colitis, you can look for risk factors for that. But importantly, also risk factors for infections. The most important risk factors for infections in this case would be risk factors for Clostridium difficile. We have both hospital-acquired and community-acquired C. diff uh, these days, but certainly risk factors like recent hospitalization, living in a nursing home, and antibiotic use uh, increase your risk for C. diff. Laboratory parameters that are important to, look, uh, uh, to evaluate include the white blood cell count, these patients often get a leukemoid reaction, so not just a white count of 12 or 15,000, but maybe 35 to 40,000. That can be seen in severe colitis. Their hemoglobin is usually low with an elevated C-reactive protein. Electrolyte disturbances can both be caused by the degree of diarrhea and, and then perpetuate worsening toxic megacolon with things like hypokalemia, which can inhibit colonic motility. Renal function is a good indirect sign of volume status and albumin a good sign of nutrition. Stool studies for enteric pathogens are also very important to rule out the infectious etiologies, as in the infectious etiologies, sometimes treatment of the infection can um, obviate the need for more inter further intervention like surgery. On radiologic imaging, the hallmark uh, of, of radiology in this context is a plain film x-ray, so a colonic diameter of more than 5.5 centimeters, as I, as I described in the definition a few slides ago, usually... Um, is, is good enough to the, to the diagnosis of toxic megacolon if they also have systemic toxicity. It's important to make sure that they don't have evidence of large bowel obstruction. That's not always easy to see in a, in an, a plain film x-ray without contrast, but if they have an obstruction, that obviously excludes toxic megacolon. Air fluid levels can sometimes be seen with, this, with what essentially looks like an ileus, although the small bowel diameter is generally normal, and they can have a loss of haustral markings. There was one study looking at ultrasound showing thin colonic walls on transabdominal ultrasound along with loss of house and a dilated colon. I could only find one case series of four um, in all of the literature and um, I'm not aware of any, any centers that use this with regularity, but for those that may have limited access to other imaging studies, this may perhaps be um, a modality to consider.
Here's an example of a plain film x-ray, and you can see a very dilated colon, a uh, very dilated transverse colon here, and then the arrows are pointing to areas that perhaps are pseudopolyps, so perhaps some degree of chronic inflammation and ulcerative colitis with a very dilated transverse colon. If you see this along with systemic toxicity, you should certainly be concerned for toxic megacolon. A CT scan can be very helpful, although oftentimes not needed. It can assess the presence and extent of colitis if there's evidence of colonic wall thickening. It can also assess for colonic dilation, though, so, though an x-ray can do so uh, usually just as well. You can also look for colonic wall thickening that suggests submucosal edema and, uh, and inflammation. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of a halo sign and the accordion sign. Uh, this so CT scan is not used regularly, but it can pick up complications that can potentially be missed on x-ray. So the halo sign, Dr. Cruz Correa showed you an example of ileal intussusception in polyposis syndrome. It's essentially, it looks like this is also called a target sign. It can be seen in intussusception, but it can also be seen uh, in the colon in, uh, in what's described as a fat halo sign. Here you see that there's different densities of the submucosa and the muscularis propria along with the mucosa. And those different densities, uh, when it's inflamed, can lead to this target appearing sign. So this is not intussusception, like you may see in the small bowel. This is uh, evidence of active inflammation called the halo sign. And then this is called the accordion sign where you can see on the picture on the left that there's oral contrast only. And so the oral contrast is lighting up the diameter of the colon. And then you have this profound thickening of the colonic walls. So this is someone who may not have toxic megacolon but certainly may have concern for very active colitis. You see on the right side also a very thickened rectal wall. So uh, CT scans can also be helpful. In terms of endoscopic evaluation, if you are highly concerned for toxic megacolon, generally speaking, endoscopic evaluation is contraindicated given the increased risk of perforation. You should certainly, if you're going to do it, um, put very little air insufflation, uh, use very little air insufflation as you're in pursuing the procedure. Uh, there have been some studies looking at the risk of sigmoidoscopy versus colonoscopy, and sigmoidoscopy carries with it a substantially lower risk as you'd expect. You're not pulling on the mesentery nearly as much in what generally is a relatively thin colonic wall. So just like we can, we can usually relatively safely do sigmoidoscopy in acute severe uh, ulcerative colitis, you can, prob you can usually get away with it uh, in, uh, in the concern for toxic megacolon as well. And left-sided evaluation is usually sufficient. Things like ischemia, may, it may not be great for things like ischemia, but those are relatively uncommon. And infectious, and infectious etiologies and IBD, which are the two most common etiologies, can be adequately seen on sigmoidoscopy since ulcerative colitis is far more commonly the etiology rather than Crohn's disease. It's also critically important to, to assess for superinfection if they have IBD and infection even if they don't. Checking for cytomegalovirus is best accomplished with endoscopic evaluation as stool for PCR and stool antigens, uh, stool antigen testing for CMV are not that sensitive nor are they specific. Well, they're specific but not that sensitive. It also can be helpful to do an endoscopy to confirm C. diff there have been a couple of studies showing people that have negative C. diff toxins that have pseudomembranes when they do a sigmoidoscopy. So if someone's C. diff toxin is negative, then perhaps there's a role for sigmoidoscopy to more conclusively exclude pseudomembranes and pseudomembranous colitis as the etiology of toxic megacolon. What I can't tell you with any certainty is whether in the era of C. diff PCR, this is still the case. Our hospital is now using uh, PCR, uh, so I'm not sure if in your hospitals, if you're still using to C. diff toxin A and B, then perhaps sigmoidoscopy would be indicated. I think in the, e in the era of PCR, if your institution has it, then perhaps you'll have a very good sensitivity with C. diff testing in the stool and don't need to do a sigmoidoscopy. But certainly for CMV, the best way to test for CMV is on biopsy, much better than stool. This is the Mayo endoscopic scoring system for how we assess the severity of colitis. On the left, you'll see the endoscopic score in general, I'm, I'm sorry, the Mayo score in general, which is not important for the purpose of this talk, but it's uh, four different criteria on a scale of zero to three. The endoscopic score has a subscore of zero to three, and you can see here um, that in, in, in broad strokes, basically going from left to right, you see progressively worse inflammation, ulcerations, loss of vascularity, and loss of haustra, suggesting worsening endoscopic disease. And here you see some evidence of severe colitis with uh, deep ulcerations, extreme friability, and, uh, and probably some pseudomembranes as well on the picture on the bottom right. So how do we treat these? So historically, the treatment has been surgical, uh, and there's different surgical techniques that can be employed. 
Recent data suggests that medical therapy may be considered early. However, the difficulty interpreting this data is that really the studies don't differentiate between severe colitis and toxic megacolon. Most studies that look at how to treat this medically look at the treatment of severe colitis and don't adequately distinguish those that have true toxic megacolon. So surgeons mostly still feel, as do many um, gastroenterologists, that the true toxic megacolon requires surgical intervention. And I found this, the, 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 um, the title of this paper amusing, that it was the outcome of colectomy from a surgical journal, a plea for early surgical management. Again, suggesting that we should sometimes know when we've exhausted medical, op medical options and go to surgery early rather than trying, uh, trying to treat them aggressively medically, in large part because we do have some data now that perhaps if you treat people with a lot of immunosuppression early, that may increase surgical complications. And that, that data is um, somewhat controversial, but nonetheless um, exists from large centers. So I won't discuss in detail the treatment of acute severe colitis, as we're focusing mostly on toxic megacolon, but just a, a few brief points. Um, IV steroids can be very helpful for acute severe colitis. Some people use hydrocortisone. I personally use solumedrol um, I, because it provides both uh, the mineralocorticoid and glucocorticoid effects, and, we, and it, um, I usually use a dose of 20 milligrams IV every eight hours. There's really very little data to suggest that higher doses than that, the kinds of doses they use for people that have, um, that have increased intra, intracranial pressure and neurosurgical trauma, those doses of steroids have, are no better than our doses of 20Q8 and all they do is increase risk. So 20Q8 should be your maximum dose. There are indices um, to predict the failure of steroids, and it's important to at least have an idea of these so you don't wait till day six when they're still failing steroids and not, have not yet considered other options or considered calling your surgeon. If they are failing steroids, particularly with the high HO index, and I'll show you what that is on the next slide, then IV cyclosporin can, add, um, can very effectively prevent colectomy. Now, whether it prevents colectomy in the long term is not as clear. It certainly prevents colectomy in the first year, but as you extend this data out to two, three, and four years, many of these patients eventually require colectomy. So, uh, you know, whether it prevents long-term colectomy is unclear, but it certainly prevents short-term colectomy. Anti-TNF agents are also, uh, can also be used for acute severe colitis. These have also been shown in some of the studies that I, that I referenced below to prevent short-term colectomy. And again, whether they prevent long-term colectomy is not as clear. I put in here that infliximab is the only drug approved um, in the United States for ulcerative colitis, whereas adalimumab and sertalizumab pegol are both approved uh, for Crohn's disease as well. Uh, earlier this week, uh, the, the FDA's advisory panel has preliminarily given the green light for adalimumab to be used in ulcerative colitis. So I would expect in this calendar year that at least in the U.S., adalimumab will, have, will gain uh, FDA approval as well. But right now, as of today, what we have is infliximab. In terms of when to choose, I, so if someone it starts with IV steroids and is not responding, in terms of when to choose cyclosporin versus infliximab, this is also not uh, clear and it's usually institution dependent. There was a study presented at last year's DDW. Um, I don't believe it's been in published form yet, but, um, but a big study looking at not, basically a non-inferiority study of cyclosporin versus infliximab. And they're both um, effective at preventing colectomy. In terms of which one to use, as I said, it's usually institution dependent. My personal preference, if someone has been exposed to thiopurines in the past and they're coming in with severe colitis already on azathioprine or failed azathioprine, my preference is infliximab over cyclosporin because if you give them cyclosporin and they get better, your next step generally is then bridging them to a thiopurine as an outpatient. If they've already failed a thiopurine as an outpatient, that is less attractive of an option. So those are patients in whom I generally prefer infliximab, but I cannot give you any convincing data that one is certainly better than the other. We do use a lot of cyclosporin in Miami and infliximab as well. Other centers use one more than the other. Whichever one you use, I think the most important point here is to avoid using one and then trying to salvage it, salvage it with another. That gives you a very minimal incremental benefit with a significant increase in the risk of infection. So if you're going to use cyclosporin or infliximab, they're both good options. But if, you, if that fails, add, then giving them the second of those two drugs tends to, tends to give you more risk than benefit. And surgery is probably inevitable. This is from a study from 10 years ago, but to highlight the, the fact that perhaps there is no better drug in inflammatory bowel disease in the short term than corticosteroids. Unfortunately, their myriad side effects make them um, a very unattractive drug in the long term. But you see here that 85% of people respond in the first month.
to, in, in ulcerative colitis. The problem is that only half of them have a prolonged response and the other half either require surgery or become steroid dependent. So I mentioned to you the, uh, the HO index, which was um, developed several years ago. And this was an index that basically looks at the number of bowel movements, your degree of nutrition in the way of albumin, and how dilated your colon is. If you have a lot of bowel movements with hypoalbuminemia and a dilated colon, uh, and that total score is more than four, then your likelihood of achieving adequate uh, symptom remission with steroids alone is only 15%. So you see there an 85% failure rate if the score is more than four on day three or 72 hours after initiation of therapy. This is important because if you're 72 hours into therapy and you're not doing well, or the patient isn't doing well, it's important to get the surgeon involved early and to have the patient make decisions about what they'd like to do, not when they're extremely ill, but when they're still well enough to, um, to make a, an informed decision on their, next, uh, plan, on their next step. Retrospectively, CRP, the higher the CRP, the more likely they are to require colectomy. You see there 57 versus 33 with a statistically significant p-value, and, and uh, a little less scientific, but severe le lesions on endoscopy, things like very large, deep ulcers, were more likely to predict colectomy. Um, and that should hopefully seem relatively intuitive for those of you that have done a colon colonoscopy on very severe, deep ulcer, um, colitis with deep ulcerations. Most of those people invariably will, will need colectomy. This is the study to which I was referring about. If you use cyclosporin or infliximab, that's fine. But if you then add the second drug on top of it, you see here on the, or in the orange bars, cyclosporin plus infliximab, um, as opposed to where you only got a cyclosporin without infliximab. And you see the marked increase in overall complications and uh, both infectious and surgical complications, which were very statistically significant. So again, it's fine to use either cyclosporin or infliximab, but probably not a good idea to use uh, one and then use the second drug if the first one fails. In terms of surgical therapy, there's no clear answer as to when to proceed with medical versus surgical therapy. Part of the issue with this, the several conflicting studies is, again, the disparity between studies that look at acute severe colitis versus those that look at truly toxic megacolon. Probably, if it's truly toxic megacolon, it, require, it will require surgery as you have a pretty low likelihood of achieving success on medic, with medical therapy alone. Whichever route you choose, have a low threshold for surgery. I think sometimes as non-surgeons, I know there's some surgeons in the room, but as non-surgeons, we tend to try to do everything we can to prevent surgery. But oftentimes, surgery is the best thing for the patient and the best thing for all parties. So have a low, have a low threshold for surgery when they have toxicity. And get the surgeon involved early. Again, this is a person in whom, even if they don't require surgery on the first or second day, they should meet the surgeon early and have that discussion with the surgeon who can, much more, who, who can in a much more informed way than we can discuss surgical complications and give another opinion. So get the surgeon involved early. If you choose to go down the route of medical therapy, look for signs of decompensation, alteration in mental status, volume, depletion, electrolyte disturbances. And remember that as you're increasing their immunosuppression by adding things like steroids and cyclosporin or infliximab, you may be increasing surgical complications. Again, there's some conflicting data on whether infliximab increases surgical complications, and if so, if that refers to wound dehiscence versus abscesses. Uh, but in any case, it probably does to some degree, and, uh, and so the more immunosuppression you put them on, you potentially may make it a little more difficult for your surgeon if they need surgery. In terms of types of surgeries, I just gave you some examples here from a, from a review article from uh, the Cleveland Clinic a couple of years ago. A, a surgery that's not done very often in the United States anymore is what's called a blowhole um, colostomy, where they, put a, where they make a colostomy in the transverse colon and then a diverting ileostomy to help decompress the colon. That's very infrequently done in the United States. What's much more commonly done is either a subtotal colectomy or a total proctocolectomy with an ileostomy. In our experience, when they have, when they're, and in the experience of our surgeons as well, when they're really sick with toxicity, it's probably best to do the quickest, easiest surgery, and that tends to be the one that doesn't involve um, going into the pelvis. So um, the, generally speaking, what's done is a subtotal colectomy, leaving in, uh, leaving in place the rectum, doing, a diverting, uh, doing the ileostomy, allowing them to cool off, and then doing a completion proctectomy um, after, they're, after they're better and, and better nourished in the way of a better albumin. Um, other things you see here include, uh, include making a pouch. Uh, we generally, again, do not do, well, we do really, in, in our center, do no one-stage procedures 
Um, and if they are presenting for a colectomy for the, for, uh, with the etiology of toxic megacolon, then we do three-stage procedures, not two-stage. Um, so with our patient, I did a flexible sigmoidoscopy. The endoscopic Mayo score was three, so it was very active disease with deep ulcerations. We checked for Clostridium difficile and biopsied for CMV, both of which were negative. Started IV solumedrol. 72 hours later, the HO index was high, suggesting a high failure rate. And at that point, he still had colonic dilation, and there are some equivocal signs of some guarding um, and rebound. So at that point, we chose to proceed directly to surgery. I didn't feel that we were going to get much incremental benefit at that point with cyclosporin or infliximab. He underwent a subtotal colectomy with endoleostomy. Um, given the uh, diagnosis of ulcerative colitis, well, this has now been done. I guess when I wrote this, it was in the future. But he has now undergone a completion proctectomy with an ileal pouch anal anastomosis. Because he had UC, and he, we were already did a subtotal colectomy, we did the curative, uh, we completed it with the curative surgery for UC, which was taking out the rest of the rectum. The surgeon made a pouch with a diverting ileostomy, and then a few months later took down the diverting ileostomy in what we did as a, what they did as a three-stage procedure, and, uh, and that, to date he's done well. So in summary, be very acutely aware of the possible complications of IBD, as well as infectious colitis. Uh, of the, all the complications, toxic megacolon carries with it the highest morbidity and mortality. Appreciate the difference between acute severe colitis, which I think we still have a decent chance of, of, of rescuing them with steroids and things like cyclosporin or infliximab, uh, versus true toxic megacolon with significant dilation and toxicity that probably will require surgery. Some debate over the exact timing of surgery. If medical therapy is started, then have a low threshold to proceed to surgery and involve the surgeons uh, from the outset. I think that is it, and thank you very much.